majestic is thy name in all the earth. I'd just like you to, if you have a prayer request, please uh, fill it out. That's in your bulletin. It's a slip, and you can just drop it in the offering plate. Also, we have many activities going on for our edification and for our growth uh, during the week here at the church and on uh, different areas of the city. We also um, want to encourage you to, we have some drop-off for uh, the Harvest uh, Helping Hands Ministry to give food to the hungry. And then also, too, we have a Bible reading schedules out in the lobby if you want to pick it up. And you can pick it up at any month, really, and start reading the Bible. And you can either read the whole New Testament or the whole Bible. It's got a very well pattern for that to take place. Also, baby tra- uh, change that we collect for the t- uh, Treehouse Ministry, which provides families at low income with uh, special needs stuff that they need for their babies and also for single parents. Come now, let us settle this, says the Lord. Though your sins are like scarlet, I will make them as white as snow. Though they are red like crimson, I will make them white as wool. Let's stand together and let's worship our God by singing.
want, you may remain seated or you can stand as we sing our praise choruses. All the
Steve, you want to read about what a friend we have in Jesus? For this man we can look at Philippians 4, 6 to 7. Do not be anxious about anything, but in everything by prayer and petition with thanksgiving, present your requests to God. And the peace of God, which transcends all understanding, will guard your hearts and minds in Christ Jesus. Perhaps the main message of this man is found in the second of verse that says, And we find the same good faith in him for all our hospitality. Jesus knows our every weakness. This is what the Lord will say. The last Father in heaven, we just want to thank you so much that you gave us a friend in Jesus. And that we can take all our cares and our worries and our burdens to you and that you carry us through the difficult times of life. I thank you, Lord, for this congregation who is very appreciative and loves you and wants to thank you. Thank you for the gifts that they give, but also, too, for their lives as they share the Lord in their world around them. Lord, bless their gifts now in Jesus' name. Amen. Let's come before the Lord in prayer. God, what a wonderful reminder as we just sang that beautiful hymn that you're our friend and we have a friend that we can take all our sorrows and our burdens to and know that you listen to us, you hear them, and you've got the power to deal with them. We give you praise and thanksgiving, God, for all that you're doing in our lives and in the world. We pray especially, Father God, right now for our nation and for the world as uh, this whole situation in the Ukraine and with Russia, Lord, we just ask you, Father, that you will quell that and peace will come and an accord will be built. We pray also, too, Father God, for China and the situations that we have with them. 
And also, too, Father, um, some of the other areas of the country that are the world that are hot spots, whether it's the Middle East or it's in Southeast Asia with the Koreans, Lord, all that, we give that all to you. And we thank you that you're in control. We pray, Heavenly Father, too, for our church as we continue to move forward in our quest to find a uh, denomination that will be well suited for our congregation and our beliefs and that someone that can challenge us and we can challenge them and that we can walk together in the strength and power of Jesus Christ. We pray also, too, for those who are on our list of concerns. We praise you for Billy, that he's doing so well from his heart surgery. We also thank you also for not only Bill Moore's health, but also Bill Rogers, who's healing in his heart surgery, too. We think of Lucille, Father, be with her. We pray for Kay. We pray also, too, for Joyce, uh, who lost her 24-year-old granddaughter this past week in a choking accident. I just pray, Lord, that you bring that family, especially her little son and her twin, Lord, that you'll be with them, Lord, during this difficult time. That you'll pour forth your fine, loving care, and you're also your wonderful relief for their grief, Lord, and give them peace as they walk through this difficult time. We pray also, too, Lord, for Don, who had his hip operated on, and for Jeff Peavy also, who's recovering from his hip surgery. We pray also, too, Father God, um, for um, those who we know that are going through addiction and their lives are still crippled. For Ryan, for Jordan, for David, for Ricky, for um, Mitch, uh, and for Mitch's cancer. We pray for them, Lord, too, and for their difficulties that they're going through. We pray also, too, for families that are in distress with marriages and difficulties in home. I pray for a friend right now that is going from PTSD, and give me wisdom to know how to help him. And we pray also, too, Father, for a family who's um, got a dad right now that's full of cancer. I just pray that you give them peace and strength in the time of difficulty for them. I praise you also, too, Lord, for this opportunity again to stand and hear your word, to worship you in our songs, and to just lift our hearts to you and, and have you uh, be our love and our contact and who cares for us every day. Lord, I just pray now for this message that will honor you and give you glory and that we can come away with something here that we need to do or something that you reminded of what you do for us and comfort us and strengthen us. And now, Jesus, um, we pray also too, Lord, I think of a couple of families that are going through marital difficulties too and also with children uh, that are going through difficulties. I pray also too for a couple that I helped yesterday. who told me yesterday they've been celebrating now 60 days of sobriety. We give you praise for that. And now, Father God, um, also I want to pray for the school, uh, the challenges that are there, the young people who are learning about God, but also some of the challenges we're having right now, Lord, that you will uh, minister to us and that um, things will go smoothly and we can get forward, Lord. Uh, thank you for this privilege that we have now here, Jesus. In your name we pray. Amen. What is the force that is driving you in your life right now? Rick Warren wrote a beautiful book called The Purpose Driven Life, sold 30 million copies, and says that a lot of lives were changed to love Jesus Christ. One of the things that the book though handles, and it talks about knowing God and living a life that glorifies God to it. Now, on bus, you know, are following Jesus, the purpose-driven life has affected a lot of people who don't believe, but there are a lot of people who don't believe it. Uh, Jim Collins, for instance, who's wrote a book about making the leap from good to great, and that's the name of his book, From Good to Great, and he talks about companies that leap from good to great, great. and he also talks about how oftentimes a lot of people don't do that. Christian schools, for instance, they're good, but they're not great. Corporations are good, but they're not great. And that's why they're not as successful as they could be. And if we look at that, uh, Dr. Alan Redpath one time wrote about there's two levels of Christian living. There's a Christian living that people just have come to know Christ, but they have not really moved that much in their Christian faith. 
There's other people who have a level of Christianity that keeps on growing every day because they keep connected with God and the Word, but they're living a Spirit-filled life, the Christ-centered life. And they're, but there's others who get locked into certain things and they can't break the barriers. Well, today we're going to talk about that with Joshua. Joshua here gives us some insight. We're at the Jordan River, a river of impossibility that most people would say. But here, this is where the power of God really is needed to break through. For 40 years, they wandered in the wilderness, and then they were on the edge of making it, and, and, and they, um, the people of God now are here. They're on the edge of the precipice to go on to the future and to grow in God. Uh-huh. 1.2 million Jews died in the desert over that 40-year people. A whole generation died because they were unfaithful to God, and they didn't take God up on it. Well, here we are at the same spot again. They're at the edge of the Jordan River and whether or not to break through. Last week, we talked about faith. This week, we're going to talk about faith in community and faith in our own abilities to walk through. Last week, we looked a little bit about faith with Rahab. She was a prostitute. She was a pagan. And yet God gave her the ability to have this faith to break through so many things that she had going against her. And today, here we are at the edge. A lot of people deal with stuff in their own lives. A lot of us have things that are going on that are difficult to do. And without faith, it's very difficult to do. And it's very easy to say, let's go back to the safe spot. Let's go back to where we were, when, how, and not move forward. But you saw what Israel did when they wanted to do that. The Bible tells us, according to John, that this is the victory that overcomes the world, our faith in Jesus Christ. And moving ahead is so important. And right now at the precipice of change and transition is the children of Israel. Right now, we as a church in our denomination, we are at a precipice of transition. That's going to be a lot different than what we've known in the past. We're going to make a lot of changes. But one of the things that's good is that we know if we let God lead us, we'll have the victory. And that we need to follow the standards and proofs of the scriptures. That's what we want. Our denomination was founded on reforming itself according to the word of God. But has gotten away from that. And so therefore, we have come to this precipice. We want to make change. We want to go on to God's future, not the world's future. And so this transition is big. And what we find here is, will the church, will we the people, Be willing to follow and listen to God and prepare ourselves for it. One of the things that happens is we get at impasses. We get to the edge. We don't change. And today the Bible is asking all of us, are we going to cross the Jericho River? Are we going to cross the the Jordan River? Are we going to let it be a barrier in our lives? Are we going to let God take us through the Jordan River? There are many barriers we have in our own hearts from the will of God. What's our personal river that blocks us from going further with Christ and doing the will of God in our own life? Some of us have difficulties. Some of us have what we think are impassable barriers to go through. What's that Jericho River that's keeping us from getting there? It's that inner obstacle. Think of some of the inner obstacles that we can easily have in our hearts. For instance, how easy it is our thought patterns can become obstacles from rather following God in faith to backing up. Or think about our temperaments. How easy that our temperaments can easily hold us back from doing the will of God in our own lives, or our personality characteristics. And some people I know who are strong Christians, and yet they say, that's just who I am. That's my personality. No, if you really trust Christ and you have him Lord of your life, you don't accept that personality characteristic. Even though you've been doing it for many years, you need to break through. And you need to go through the river and go to the other side and see how it is and begin to follow God faithfully through it. 
to go through your personal obstacle. Maybe it's somebody in your life that you're struggling with. Maybe it's something that's happening in your life right now. Maybe it's someone who is dealing, you're dealing with. You got to break through that obstacle. And how to do that, Jordan begins to speak to us about it. Look what he says. He says, first, get your heart right. Then Joshua, early in the morning, and he and the sons of Israel set out at Shittim. And they came to Jordan, and they lodged there before the cross. And at the end of the three days, notice it's three days. They need to die there first. The officers went through the midst of the camp, and they commanded the people, saying, when you see the Ark of the Covenant of the Lord your God, with the Levitical priests carrying it, then you set out from your place and go before him. He's giving them the pet talk. He wants them to get ready to make this action. But he says, before you do that, however, there shall be between you and it a distance of 2,000 cubics by measure. Do not come near it, that you may know the way by which you go. For you have not passed this way before. And Joshua said to the people, Consecrate yourselves. For tomorrow the Lord will do wonders among you. Here we have Joshua speaking to the children of God. He wants them to hear and understand there's things that need to be done before you cross the river. First, you need to be willing to get up and follow the priest who've got the Ark of the Covenant. Why are they carrying the Ark of the Covenant? Wouldn't it be bulky? Wouldn't it hold them back? No, there's a purpose that God has why they're following the Ark of the Covenant. God has the Ark of the Covenant to remind them that He is present with them. That He hasn't left them alone and that He will be with them in their guide and will take them through this river. That's a barrier to the blessings that He has for them. His presence is there. In the Ark of the Covenant, you have, for instance, the Ten Commandments. Those are reminders of God's giving us the law to which we can live and love each other and love God. And that how we fail them uh, sometimes and how we need God to forgive us. And that he also provided bread inside the Ark of the Covenant. To remind the people that he fed them in the desert. That the soles of their feet didn't even wear out. Their shoes didn't wear out in those 40 years. And that they also the rod that struck the rock that brought the water out. He provided for them water that they needed every day. He provided the sustenance with them. And he wants them to realize that. And how did he do that? By carrying the ark up in front of them. And notice what is on top of the ark. He's got the mercy seat. He wants them to realize that even though they break those commandments, God has mercy on them. And when they sprinkle blood on it, the day of atonement, they wash away their sins. He's provided even for their sinfulness. And that we reminded then that the manna feeds us, that the water refreshes us. These are all things that God did. But notice what he says. Stay a mile behind Why does he say a mile behind? Because he wants them to realize how much greater God is to them than they know. How many people understand the greatness of God? Right now I'm teaching a a class on the attributes of God. And teaching the kids how great God is. They have no understanding how far beyond us he is and how eternally he is. And how much he knows. He knows everything about us. He knows what's going to happen to us today. He knew what was going to happen in the past. And he knows what's going to happen to us in 10 years. This is how great God is. And what God wants them to realize is that they stay back from God. Because his presence is so great and so awesome. And the more we understand that in our own heart the better we fit in and the better we feel about ourselves, the better we understand life and what happens because we see how great God and how how his mind is so much far beyond us. The Bible tells us in Isaiah, he says, his thoughts are not my thoughts, neither are his, his thoughts my thoughts because his thoughts are so much greater than ours and that we need to understand that in order to handle the difficulties we go through in life. And that this God is so much greater than us. And that's why we need to consecrate ourselves. Because he's so much greater. We need to come before him clean, washed, clean by the blood of Christ. 
Here he talks about that they're to take, all, and when consecration took place, they would make great preparations. They would wash their clothes. They would take a bath, which was unusual because water was short. And yet they wanted to be ready to receive what God had. And they wanted to be prepared spiritually to meet with God and gather in his presence and do what he says, no matter what was called of. What God is saying through Joshua, prepare yourself. Prepare yourself spiritually. Prepare yourself morally. Prepare yourself to meet with me. Get rid of all the sin. Consecrate yourself and set yourself apart from the world. See, this is the tragedy that the church is going through right now in the world. It hasn't separated itself. It's not showing itself distinct and set itself apart. And then we need to come before our Lord and go into the secret parts of our hearts, which the Holy Spirit can search. If God's Spirit searches the heart of God, don't think that it can't search your heart and mine. And look at the obstacles. Show us the things, the tragedies, the hurts that we have, the difficulty that we're going through that are breaking us and keeping us away and we're holding on to them and let them, Lord, wash us clean to get rid of the bondage of resentment or grudges or hate and only become clear thinking with the power of God, not giving ourselves as slaves to negativity or to ruthless thoughts or emotions that don't free us for Christ's work, but instead come before God and have him cleanse us and to repent from them and make them new and to do things that are difficult to do. And yet we have what he promises us the power to do that. There are certain things that happen in our lives that we all deal with that are not easy to swallow. This past week, you know, when I was called, I had called a, one of our parishioners and the next day she called me back crying because her granddaughter had choked on a piece of meat in the middle of the night. Evidently, she put her son to bed and went to bed at 24 years old and her son woke up in the morning to go to school and he found his mom dead. And it's hard to wrap our minds around that kind of thing. And we ask ourselves, why God? And how could you allow this to happen? Those are all understandable reactions. And that's why we need this heart for God to trust him, even when our world doesn't make sense. And put ourselves on spiritual alert and have God work in us to give us understanding and power to overcome these things. To get rid of those sins in our life that easily block us we don't realize, but sometimes even our own sin can block a family. We look at Achan in the Old Testament. His stealing wound up taking down his whole family because he was disobedient to God. And that's why God calls us through Joshua to get our hearts right. To set ourselves apart. To be different in our thinking. And that he sends out these men for three days to make this consecration thing take place. This is important because the things that we face in life are not easy to face. And they can become a block to us from doing and experience God's blessings in the future. Here they are at the banks of the Jordan River and it's a raging. It's during the harvest season and the water overcomes the banks. The Jordan River today is not what it used to be like. In fact, what happened is over the last 4,000 years, there were farmers who began to farm and they began to take water and siphon it off the Jordan River. And the Jordan River's level has really dropped. But back in that day, they didn't have that and it was flooded. And these people are looking, how are we going to get through this water? There are times that we go through difficulties in our life. How are we going to be able to get through this and honor you, God? So I can get the blessings that you have already laid out for me. And the question comes, our emotions, our thoughts get caught up in this. And we question him. And that's why it's so needful. 
that we consecrate ourselves and see him for who he is and how much greater he is than we are and ever could be. That's why the distance we need to see and understand God's way. And some of this we won't even understand until we die and go to heaven. But we need to get ourselves right. Many of us grew up in homes. You know, when we were kids, how many of us had the Sunday go to meet and close? <laughs> yeah. And we had to wear those nice ties and those outfits. Why? Because our parents wanted us to get to understand that we're to be consecrated. We're removed and we're seeing a God who's awesome. And we're to respect him and put on our best for him, not our worst, not our most shabbiest. And I can remember as a spoiled boy, you know, wearing a tie and a jacket. I still struggle with not coming to church. With it. In fact, I'm struggling today with wearing this shirt. That's because of what was built in my head. And that God was not just this flipping, hey, buddy, you're my buddy, my good guy. No, he's a sovereign God. And then what we find here, as they consecrate themselves as they put themselves aside, that they see it's from the living God. It's not just doing the duty. It's truly awing and respecting God and knowing that he has the picture better. It's hard to look at life if you don't have that awesomeness of God. Even the crises and the difficulties of life are easily and more palatable taken when you have a deeper under. Psychologists have found this out. That people who have a deep faith are much more easily able to handle crises and tragedies in their life because they have a background of a strength in God that he knows what he's doing and they respect and trust him even though it doesn't make sense to them. People today are losing it. Why do they lose it? Because they don't have that anchor. They've not been through the crises or difficulties or they have. And once they get a little crisis in their life, they want to end it all. But you see here, Joshua says, prepare yourself. Consecrate yourself. Set yourself aside for this great and awesome God who knows everything, who knows everything about you and knows when is the right time for things to happen in your life. And as we trust that God, we know he will take us through the difficulties and that we can go through those difficulties and that we can live a life with the living God. See, and here, not only get our hearts right, but then take the steps. Take the steps of faith. It shall come upon when the soles of the feet of the priest who carried the ark of the Lord and the Lord of all earth and rest the waters of the Jordan that the waters of the Jordan will cut off and the waters which are flowing down above will stand in one heap. And so when the people set out from the tents to cross the Jordan with the priests carrying the ark of the covenant before them and when those who carried the ark came into the Jordan and their feet of the priests carried the ark where dipped in the edge of the water for the Jordan flow overflows all its banks and all the days of harvest. So here it is. They're following the priest. They come to the Jordan River and they put their feet in the Jordan River that's swollen with water. You can imagine what they're thinking. How is this going to happen? And here the priests put their feet in and all of a sudden the waters roll up. The ground is dry. And here they were willing to take the step of faith, these priests. And here God showed them this miraculous parting. So they could get through to the other side. To the place where they were promised great blessings from God. To enjoy and to find in their lives. And they crossed it. God gave them spiritual maturity more than their forefathers who gave up at Kadesh Barnea and why decided to go back to Egypt and wound up wandering for 40 years. Here, Joshua, his name in really is transliterated in the Greek to Jesus. 
And here we're seeing that God is already telling us, folks, that we have a deliverer in Joshua and is futurely talking to us about this deliverer, Jesus Christ, who's going to come. And all the things that wrapped around this episode in Israel's history, the three days waiting, all that is contributing to us to telling to us, folks, this is going to happen down the road and salvation will come to all mankind through this Joshua. Or in the Hebrew, it, it, it's called Yeshua HaMashiach. And it's Jesus the Messiah or Joshua the Messiah. He's coming. And the Ark of the Covenant, he's our Ark who goes through before us and parts the waters in our life and takes us out of our sinfulness and wandering and into the promised land. And it's not heaven. You know, many songs were written in the old days of hymns were saying that Canaan or Beulah land was heaven. And that's not what this is talking about. When Joshua takes the people into Canaan, he takes us into the spirit-filled life in a world that's full of sin and struggles and difficulties. When they walked into Canaan, there were battles there were obstructions. There were all kinds of things going on. And God is showing us how we are to live as Christians in a world that's fallen, that's filled with obstacles, that's filled with things that will try to derail your Christianity and how you need to trust and follow Christ. You see, that's the beautiful part of this. It's showing us how to live. And it's telling us that God has things. Once we cross through it, once we get through our barriers, once we get through these things and give our lives to Christ and we get to the other side, there are still going to be trials and tribulations and difficulties, but God will grow us and give us the strength and the power spiritually to be able to deal with those things. That as we're filled with the Holy Spirit and we rest on him more and more, he will give us the strength to go through it. This Canaan. And there's battles right off the bat. But you see, the Bible promises. And God is promising us through this. That he has already made provisions for us to deal with these things. And given us the power through his Holy Spirit to deal with these things. It's kind of like the other day. I walked into my house and there was that little baby that continues to attract me when I come home. And she was giggling and cooing, and I started playing with her legs and stuff like that. And then I thought, you know what? This little baby can't talk. It doesn't run. It doesn't have all this, but it has the capability. And then the next day, I went up to Hutchinson and watched my other granddaughter, who was running around the basketball court like a jackrabbit. And I'm saying to myself, that little baby's got that same potential in her. And God has provided for us through the power of the Holy Spirit that potential for us as we go out into Canaan and living in our world with the obstacles and trials and all kinds of difficulties that we have the Holy Spirit within us that will help us carry us through and get us through those battles and to overcome them and to live the Christian victorious life that God has laid out for us already. And that's sometimes hard for us to believe. Because we, like the Israelites here, they're standing at the Jordan. They're seeing these overflowed banks. And they're saying, how is this going to happen? And then they see the priest. Who's showing them that God's presence is here. And they set their feet by faith in that water. And the water opens. And it builds up on the sides. And there's dry land in which they can walk through to the other side. And that they have victory in their lives. And that Canaan is theirs because God has promised it. But we need to go through it. And not be fearful looking at the water. When is it going to come collapsing on us? But that we know that God has promised us that we will get through safely to the other side. You see, here's the key. The world tells us one thing, but God tells us something else. 
I was thinking about this when I was... The song came on the radio not too long ago, Bridge Over Troubled Waters. We all know that song, Simon and Garfunkel. And the world tells us that we need to build the bridge over that water. And times are going to be rough. And that there's going to be painful times. And the Bible says to us here, God doesn't build bridges over our troubles and keeps us from feeling the pain. God takes us through the waters on dry ground. And we face those trials and we deal with them in our faith and trust in Christ. And that we know we have the power to overcome them. And we don't have to let the world and these crises cripple us. But rather, we're new people with the power of God within us that sets us free. Paul says it in Galatians 2.20. I am crucified with Christ. We've given it up. We're not letting the barrier of the Jordan River hold us back. We're not letting the world's view hold us back. But we're walking forward and we're going to get to the other side and we've got things that God has for us that are so tremendous. And that we to use these crises and difficulties to build us stronger in the faith. And not get discouraged. Not want to throw in the towel. I was talking about this someone today and about, oh, retirement looks so good. No, I don't. You know, I love my job. And sometimes it drives me nuts. (laughs) But you know what? It's God working on Dave and making Dave grow up. And be able to make choices and changes and do things to glorify God and make a difference in the world. That he keeps on moving. Not lays down and gives up. But to take the steps across the Jordan River. To get on to the other side of the great things God has. It's called the deeper life, a higher life. Whatever you want to call it, the spirit-filled life. Because the more we go through those things. And the more challenges we accept by faith and we go through them with God, the stronger we get, the stronger our relationship to God is and that we really come to appreciate Him more and depend on Him more. That's the victorious life in Christ we have. Well, we can throw in the towel and just try to lob through life. No! God's got this. He wants us to go through this. Get to the other side. Where God wants to make us more like Jesus Christ and conform us to the image of him. Romans 8, 29. And then he wants us to pass it on. I think this is the tragedy of our world today. I I was contacted by a friend who wants to know how to share his faith better. And one of the things I want to teach him is the way to do your testimony. Because your testimony is so important of what God Before you were a Christian, what God brought into your life to change your life? And how is he working now in your life, the future, and growing you in Christ? Those are so essential in telling our story. Our grandchildren need to hear this. They need to understand how God works in your life. You are a valuable asset. And to your children, a valuable asset of showing how God works in your life. And the things he's doing in your life, both in the past and what he's doing in the present. Because these children have no anchor today without Christ. As in every day, but especially today. Some of them don't have any values. And some of the values they were taught by their parents are so bad and wrong. I remember 12 years ago, a friend of mine owned a trailer park. And he had his church do the, the VBS, Vacation Bible School, during the summer. 70 kids came. Only two of them knew about Jesus Christ. The rest of them knew about Jesus Christ by the words were used as Jesus Christ as the curse word, but not know him about God. <laughs> And you know what kind of kids we're raising today? Or we see that are being raised today and our kids 
need to be protected in the Lord and, 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 and have the strength because they're going to be tested more than we were as parents and as grandparents. One of my chaplains was coming out of Walmart the other day. And this little girl, 14, 15 year old, comes out and says, Hey, mister, you want me to do a bop for you? Bop. She said, Yeah, whatever you want, I can go in there and get it for you, and you can pay me half price. She was going to rip it. She was going to take and go into the store and steal, shoplift that item, and have him give her half the price, and so that they both wind up doing good. That's, that's the kind of kids we've got going on here today. You see, and it is so wrong. And, and, and yet, you wonder, did she figure that out herself? Or I can tell you of situations that I know, and there's people, um, Scott could probably tell you too, where they would shoplift in the store and they'd use the baby as their way to hide stuff underneath in their carriages. This is the kind of parents that are raising the children today. And we have the greatest voice and we have the way and we need to let them know this because this is sick. It's destroying our society. There are people who are closing stores because people are just ripping them off. It's a tragedy that's going on in our society today. And here we are. Joshua says, let's pass it on. Thus the sons of Israel did as Joshua commanded and took up 12 stones from the middle of Jordan. And just as the Lord spoke to Joshua, according to the number of tribes of the sons of Israel, and carried them over to the lodging place and put them down there. And then Joshua set 12 stones in the middle of the Jordan to place where the feet of the priests had carried the Ark of the Covenant were standing and they were there too also. So what Joshua does... He sets a memorial in the middle of the Jordan River to remind the Israels to picture in their mind, this is what God did and delivered you. Then look what happens. They go to Gilgal, which is right down the street. And it says, those 12 stones which they had taken from the Jordan, they took another set of stones from the Jordan, and Joshua set it up at Gilgal. And he said to the sons of Israel, when your children ask the fathers in the time to come, saying, what are these stones? Then you shall inform your children, saying, Israel, cross this Jordan on the dry ground. You see what God is doing through Joshua? He's building the memory that God was at work and he helped his people. And that this is the way to do it by faith. Trusting God. Not taking a spiritual retirement, but rather symbolizing to God is with you all the time. And don't be afraid to take things on. And the word Gilgal means roll the way. Reminds us the words of rolling away the stone when Jesus rose from the again. It means power. And there were all kinds of things that happened at Gilgal. And those reminders were there right for the children of the priests. The prophets were trained there. And this monument that was built in Gilgal was used to help establish the nation. And tragically though, as sinful as the Israelites are and we are, they turned it into an idol. And Amos came down on them for that. But if we remember, this is the beautiful thing about, you know, what we have at Arlington National Cemetery, the memory and the Vietnam plaque, all these World War I, World II, remember where we come from and why we have this freedom. And then Joshua is saying, God gave us this. And this didn't come easy, but God was the deliverer. And gave us what we have. And he rolled away. He rolled back the waters. So we could come into the promised land. And receive the gifts that God had already laid out for us. And that we could do his will. These are spiritual markers. To the wonderful things God does. And he does it. Number one because it's a remembrance to the whole world. 
That this is the God that we serve. He's not some wooden God that we try to talk to that doesn't answer us. He does things. He changes rivers. This is the God we have. And that we're to teach the children. This is the God that owns and runs this world. He's the one who we're to be faithful to. He's the one that we're to teach our grandchildren to. And that this tool is a testimony to us of our great God. And that dads and grandfathers, moms and grandmas, we need to remind the kids that this life is a gift from God. Not something you take for granted and think it's always going to be there. It changes very rapidly. And the one thing that we know is that the church is only one generation away from becoming extinct. And that we should be grateful to what God has given us in the church. And that we have these memorials to remind us of how God works and how he works in our lives and how he helps us. And it begins by him not letting us fall into the trap and asking him to help us look at our barriers that are holding us back from living the Christian life and confess them and get through them and move on to the blessings that he's given to us. And that he rolls away and gives us the resurrection life filled with the power of the Holy Spirit. You know, there's things in this life that we definitely cannot do. I've dealt with people who've had issues with forgiveness. Forgiveness is a hard thing to do. And I've seen it where we need the power of God to help us forgive. Because in our nature, our sinful nature, we want the pay. We want them to pay. We want them to, 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 to owe us. We want to hold that grudge. It feels so good. And yet it destroys us inside. And that we need the power of God to be able to forgive. I've got friends who've had difficulties forgiving their parents. I've had spouses who've had hard time forgiving their spouse for cheating on them or whatever. And we need the power of God to actually forgive them fully and completely in Christ. I know kids that were raped by their siblings or by their parents and, and to find the forgiveness. And God can give it. And it can be broken through and the blessings of God can be sought and got. Filled with the Holy Spirit not letting that grudge or hatred hold us back. And that's tough as a person. But God can do that. You know, forgiveness is hard, especially when we've been wronged very deeply. I was reading about that this past week. And it's a story that we're all familiar with. Back in 1990, I think seven or eight. I don't know where you were. But when you heard that the Mara building blew up and how many 160 plus people were killed in that disaster. And what had happened, we all stole the story and how it unfolded and how they caught Timothy McVeigh, how it was by a, what some would call a freak accident by a trooper, but we knew God had him caught. And then to watch Timothy McVeigh go through his trial, then to be executed. And when the news broke, a lot of people knew that story. But a lot of people didn't know this story. There was a man by the name of Bob Bud Welch, who his daughter was killed 
in that bombing. As a Christian, he said, I could not get rid of the hatred and the anger and the bitterness that I had towards Timothy McVeigh and his family. Even after he was executed. And he knew that as a Christian that wasn't right. So in 1998, he traveled to Kansas to see Bill McVeigh, Timothy McVeigh's father. And many people had scorned Bill McVeigh in his hometown, calling him the father of a monster. And Bud was weary about going to see him. And Bill was weary about him coming to meet him. But Welch visited hoping to find some healing from this bitterness and anger he had. They talked about their children, he said, over coffee at the kitchen table. And there on the wall was a high school picture of Timothy McVeigh. Good looking boy, he said to Bill McVeigh. And Bud later said that Bill McVeigh said to me, I am so sorry that your daughter was killed. And Bud Welch said, I never felt so close to God than at that very moment. He said, I felt this heavy burden of relief fall off my shoulders. He said, and then we did this thing, we prayed together. And it seemed like all the bitterness and the resentment left. Here we were, two friends, two children lost. And instead of simply getting healing for me, he said, I believe I brought a, a measure of healing for Bill McVeigh, who was another father who had a heart broken of the loss of a child. You see, God can do that. He can help us forgive even the worst of the worst of things. He can give us the ability. But we need to trust him and follow his lead to get through to the other side and not let that barrier hold us back to receive God's blessing and here give God's blessing to a broken heart too. Let's pray together. Father in heaven, we thank you that you have all this power and that you love us and you care so much for us. Lord God, I pray for anybody here who has a Jordan obstacle in front of them, that Lord, that you give them the strength to break through that and to follow you through that and gain victory over it. And then, Lord, to take them out as we go and leave this place and show the many blessings that are there still for us to claim that you have out there for us and that we can trust you, the sovereign Lord, the king of the universe, and that our faith is securely held by you through Jesus Christ. We thank you for the forgiveness you've given us. And we thank you for your love. So undeserving, and yet, God, you loved us from your love and from your mercy. And we're forever grateful. Help us to see you and grab what you have for us each and every day. In Jesus' name, amen. Let's stand and let's close and with our benediction and singing our closing song. And now the God that commanded the light out of darkness shine in our hearts to bring us the joy of Jesus Christ. Amen.